So welcome to everybody. Welcome to the uh, 16th uh, Ingegner Rodolfo de Benedetti lecture. Um, it's very nice to go back to a, a lecture being done in presence. Last lecture was delivered online because it was given during uh, the pandemic. So it's very nice today to be all here. Uh, we are very happy for that. Um, a, a dominant theme, theme of, the, of this uh, series of lectures has been uh, uh, income distribution, income inequalities. Uh, the first lecture was delivered by Thomas Piketty. At the time, I think uh, very few people knew him and his work. And it was on the long run uh, inequality. Then we had uh, also a very nice lecture by Tony Atkinson on earning inequality, Emmanuel Saez, looking also that time was quite a pioneering work on the top, uh, very top uh, uh, incomes. Uh, and finally, uh, Hilary Hoynes, uh, looking at inequalities during a recession. The second uh, lecture of this series was uh, delivered by Alberto Alesina, and it was on uh, preferences for and support, political support for a distributive policy. And the key question that he was addressing at that time was why uh, the welfare state is so much different in terms of magnitude as well as in terms of characteristics on the two sides of the Atlantic. So I have to say that today's lecture, delivered by Stefanie Stancheva, will be very much on this vein and look at, indeed, uh, the support for uh, redistributive uh, policies. So without further ado, I will uh, give a flow. I just tell you the sequence will be that there will be an introduction by Nicola Gennaioli, uh, who will present uh, uh, Stefanie Stancheva, and then we will have a lecture. Uh, I ask you uh, uh, to keep the question. I, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. At the end, uh, uh, after uh, Stephanie uh, lecture, there will be uh, uh, Julia Giupponi who will introduce the discussion. So, and then there will be uh, uh, a possibility to have uh, interaction and question from the floor. Unless, perhaps, if you have very specific comments on a slide, something that you do not understand. But otherwise, please keep your question for the very end, so that we have uh, Stephanie can can go through the entire presentation. Uh, without interruption. Okay, so, uh, uh, Nicola. Thank you, Tito. It is a great honor for me to introduce Stephanie Stancheva, a Nathaniel Ropes Professor of Economics at Harvard University. She needs no introduction. You're surely familiar with her impressive accomplishments. She graduated from MIT in 2014, and before joining the Harvard Economic Department, was for two years at the prestigious Harvard Society of Fellows. She has won many prestigious international prizes and she's also involved in high-level policy making, being a member of the Council of Economic Advisors of the French Prime Minister. I would like to spend a few words on her research path. Her interests initially were always in public economics and policy, but mostly focused on the theory of optimal taxation. Uh, later, however, quite soon, actually, uh, she moved toward political economy. Perhaps, we never talked about it, but perhaps because she realized that if you want to uh, understand and help design public policy, you need to grasp the politics of it. Uh, that's very important. Now, the key of her research is that rather than taking the political economy toolkit off the shelf, at that point, she pursued it with an original approach, which brought her to discover the insights that she will 
present today. Political economy, to understand the background, typically places a lot of weight on the supply side, which is, yes, uh, there are voter preferences that need to be aggregated, but the main emphasis is on the aggregating mechanisms. It's on politicians, it's on parties, it's on electoral rules, it's on institutions, such as parliaments and governments. Stefanisky insight has been to refocus of the analysis from the supply side to the demand side of politics, which is to refocus it on the very voter preferences that need to be aggregated in the very first place. So what is that voters want? What is that voters believe? How do they think about economic policy? And if we provide information to voters, do we change what they believe and what they want? Addressing this question is critical. Populist waves, past and recent, show that radical voter demands may sometimes utterly disrupt established parties and reverse political institutions. But voter demands are important even in less dramatic events. For instance, voters these states for the inheritance tax, which is sometimes called the debt tax, may cause government to resort to less efficient and fair sources of revenue. Why do voters think that way? Stefani's work, some of which has been in collaboration with our dear Alberto Alesina, offers invaluable insights by showing what is that voters believe and want about immigration, redistribution, taxation, and other policies. So, Stephanie, we are very excited to have the opportunity to learn these things from you today. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, can you hear me well? Okay, shout if you can't. Um, it's really an honor to be giving the Rodolfo Di Benedetti lecture and um, to be here also for the conference in memory of Alberto Alesina, our dear colleague, mentor, and friend. And as you will see, a lot of the work I'll present today is actually joined uh, with Alberto. And so today I want to talk to you about what shapes our support for redistribution policy. And the evidence will come from social economic surveys and experiments. First, I want to give a big thank you to Bocconi um, and to the amazing students from here that have worked with me through the years, um, who are, you know, many of them in this room. Um, and I hope that this is something that will continue going forward. It's been really an immense uh, honor and pleasure for me to be able to work with such amazing students uh, from here. So thank you to Bocconi. So the method that we're going to use in all these projects here um, is social economic surveys and experiments. We call it social economics because it is about how people form their views on economic policies, but taking into account the broader social context and social phenomena. And surveys are really a key tool to go in depth in people's minds and understand how they reason. So of course, surveys have been around for a very long time. We have opinion polls, uh, that ask people very short questions at, after elections. We have administrative surveys that have been used traditionally to measure things like income, um, transfer receipt, unemployment, which today are better measured in administrative data sets that we have. But there's some things that remain still invisible in other data, no matter how good it is. And those things are knowledge, perceptions, attitudes, reasoning. And for those things, our traditional revealed preference approaches, which we like as economists, you know, inferring people's unobservables from observed behavior, backing it out, those typically hit their limits. Because when it comes to policy views on, or reasoning about policy views, we don't often reveal that behavior with our, you know, 
daily behaviors, or even with voting, because we're very rarely asked to vote on specific issues. Even if we see those votes, it's hard to infer what the underlying reasoning is. So sometimes the better way is simply to ask people directly. And so surveys are a great complement to our usual revealed preference approaches. And for the results to be reliable, of course, it's very critical that the surveys are well designed. So hopefully I will convince you with some examples here of the sort of work that goes into the design of proper questions. They have to be deployed on appropriate samples, which sometimes means large representative samples and other times targeted groups uh, that you are particularly interested in. And so the topic here will be how we think about redistribution policy. So let me give you a very brief conceptual framework, all verbally, about the sort of ingredients that go into forming our policy views. And this is based on a project um, that is called Understanding Tax Policy, How Do People Reason? So when we think about redistribution policy, one of them being tax policy, we typically have in mind the following effects. First, we form some view about the efficiency effects of that policy, which means what will be the economic costs of it? You know, is it going to hurt growth? Is it going to make people stop work, etc.? Then we also think about who's going to win and who's going to lose, what you can call the distributional effects of the policy. After that, we put some sort of fairness notion on top of that to say, how fair do I think it is that those people win and those people lose? Which leads us to considerations such as, to what extent are people entitled to keep their income? Is income rather the result of effort or luck? Do high income earners deserve their income, etc.? And then another thing that plays a role potentially is what we think about the government as an institution. Do we trust it? Do we think it is competent? Is it wasting a lot of revenues, et cetera? And if you look at people's views, um, in general, you find the following sort of cleavage, that people reason very differently about tax policy, and the lines are very cleanly almost by political affiliation. It's almost tautological, as the redistribution issue is almost at the core of the left-right divide. So if you're someone on the left, you will typically tend to think that taxes have fewer economic costs. You will typically tend to think that if you raise taxes on high incomes, well, it's going to help everyone. It's going to hurt the top, but help everyone else. So you don't believe in this idea of trickle down, which is that cutting taxes at the top is going to help everyone. Your fairness views are likely that inequality is mostly unfair and that luck is quite important for being rich. You tend to trust the government more and think the government should have a broader scope and take on more roles. And then finally, even if you go down to the level of basic reality, and that is something that Alberto and I called the polarization of reality, even at that basic level, you will have a different view on what taxes currently are or what inequality currently is, depending on whether you're on the left or on the right, which is particularly striking given that these are things you can go and search for on Google if you want it. It is not hard to find information. So these are all the ingredients that could potentially shape our views on redistribution. But ultimately, what matters most? Well, it turns out that if you horse race these considerations, if you try to see what matters most, it turns out that people care most about who wins, who loses, and how fair is that? Other considerations, like what are the economic costs of those policies, are much more second order. So to put it differently, people will support different levels of taxes or different levels of redistribution, not because they have different views about their economic costs, which they do, but because they have very different views about who gains, who loses, and how fair that is. And because of that, I want to dig into this notion of what is fair in people's eyes and those core ideas of who do they think is a winner and a loser from policies and ultimately how fair they think that is. So for that, let's dive into some of the factors that shape people's views about winners, losers, and fairness. And those topics will be in this order, perceptions of social mobility and equality of opportunity, views on immigration, people you know, that are not from our country, racial attitudes, and then perceptions of one's own ranking relative to others. So let's dive straight away into the first paper, 
uh, which is joined with Alberto and with Eduardo Tesso at Northwestern. And it's about social mobility and equality of opportunity. So our starting point here is all these theories that have been written about the fact that you're much more willing to tolerate inequality if you think that the path to that inequality has been fair. So if you think that there has been more equality of opportunity to start with. So if you think everyone had the same chance to start with, you're much more willing to accept that people may end up in different positions because of their own effort. And so we wanted to see, is that true in the data? Is that link there? And we also want to see, are people accurate at all about the mobility that they perceive in their country? So for that, we did large-scale surveys in five countries. We have the US, the UK, Italy, France, and Sweden. So very different countries with very different economic and social systems. And we first tried to elicit people's views about what is mobility in their country. So this is how we do it. Remember, I told you that a lot of work goes into the design of the questions themselves. And so here's, for instance, an intuitive way to ask people about mobility. You know, asking in general about probabilities or about difficult concepts you know, is not a great idea. But this is actually a very intuitive way with which to imagine social mobility. So people see two ladders. On the left, they have the parents' income distribution. So here, we ask them to imagine 500 families that represent, in this case, the US population, and that are ranked from the 100 poorest all the way to the 100 richest. On the right, you have the children's incomes. When the children grow up, where will the children land? Again, from the poorest 100 to the 100 richest. And we ask people, please take 100 children from the poorest 100 families and allocate them, when they grow up, where will they land in the income distribution? And so that has to add up to 100. And so people are basically giving us an estimate of how those 100 kids will do when they grow up. So what do we find? Let me show you some of the core findings. So let's start with this view that you could call you know, pessimism about mobility, which is the chance that you have about staying stuck in the bottom. So how many of those 100 kids will actually remain in the bottom of the ladder? So these are numbers out of 100. On the horizontal axis, you have the reality in each country. So you see, for instance, that the US is the least mobile country, according to that metric. In the US, most, you know, more kids than in other countries will remain stuck in the bottom. The European countries are more mobile. In fact, Sweden is the most mobile. On the vertical axis, you have the average perception of respondents in that country. And so here, you can see that European countries are on average too pessimistic. They overestimate the chance of staying stuck in poverty relative to the reality in their country. The US is relatively accurate, if anything, very slightly over-optimistic. What about another metric, which you could call the American dream? It's this idea of making it from the very bottom to the very top. So this we can see now. So now you have on the horizontal axis the number of kids from the bottom that will make it to the very top of the ladder. So this idea of you know, moving from the very bottom to the very top, the American dream idea. So reality seems to be that the American dream is actually least alive in the US because the US, according to this metric, only has 7.8 kids out of 100 that will be able to make it to the top. European countries, on average, have more. However, you see that the perceptions on the vertical axis look very different. Again, European countries are slightly too pessimistic. They tend to underestimate the chance of kids making it, but less so than for staying stuck in the bottom, while the US completely overestimates that probability. So US respondents are really overly optimistic about this American dream, which is clearly maybe only a dream at this point. And so we try to understand then what is the link between these perceptions, which some of them are misperceptions, and people's views on redistribution. And I've summarized the results on this slide verbally. So first of all, most people are worried about the lack of opportunity. So this is perhaps one example where there's very strong bipartisan consensus on the fact that if children's outcomes are very correlated with their parents' outcomes, that's not a good thing. So people worry about a lack of opportunity. However, 
people's favorite solution, what they want to do about it, is completely different depending on their political orientation. And in particular, if you're someone on the left, you will really want to favor government intervention. So if you're someone on the left and you think there is low mobility, you want to have more redistribution, both sort of redistribution of income exposed, like social insurance, progressive taxation, but also what you may call equality of opportunity policies, like more investments in education or in health policy. On the other hand, you know, uh, if you're someone who's on the right, more right-leaning, you will tend to think that the government is actually part of the problem rather than the solution. So you will tend to think that the best way to resolve lack of opportunity is to have the government get out of the economy, you know, free the economy, let the economy function, and that's the way to actually get more mobility. And this can be mapped, of course, to radically different views about the government and trust in government. And it's very consistent with other findings. For instance, some work I've done with Ileana Kuziemko, Mike Norton, and Emmanuel Saez, where we experimentally vary people's trust in government by simply making them think about topics that they dislike about government. For instance, uh, the Wall Street bailout, or foreign aid, or campaign financing, without giving them any information. And seeing that people who reduce their trust in government really want less government action, which is very intuitive. So the same perceived problem, in this case, lack of opportunity, really strongly shapes views on redistribution, but also takes very different forms depending on whether you're on the left or on the right. Let's move to the second topic, which is that of immigration. And this here, we want to look at what is happening when people have more immigration in their country. Are they accurate about immigrants' characteristics? Do they even know who immigrants are? What are their economic, their social, their ethnic compositions? And then how does that influence their views on policies, on redistribution policy? And it is again in the same spirit of what's important that we spoke about in the framework in the beginning. Is it about who wins and loses from policies? In this case, do people think it is immigrants that disproportionately gain from redistribution? And how fair they think that is? And so this project is done in six countries. So in addition to the previous five, we have also Germany here in the mix. And so the first part will basically elicit people's views about a range of characteristics of immigrants, such as their unemployment rates, their poverty rates, their reliance on government transfers, their religions, their countries of origins, etc. And the second part will try to see what is the link between those perceptions about immigrants and people's views on redistribution. So let me show you first a few key facts about people's perceptions of immigrants. Let's start with the perceived versus actual number of immigrants. And this is pretty stark. So here, each row is one separate country. And the blue diamond shows us the actual share of immigrants in that country. While the red square tells us the average perception of respondents in that country. The first thing you can see is that in all countries, people really overestimate the share of immigrants, quite, quite starkly. Now, there's a few things that may come to your mind. One is, did you really ask this question in the right way, or are you systematically prompting people to say a larger number? The way we do this is to ask people to select the number of immigrants on a slider, and as they do that, they have a little pie chart that starts gray and then starts updating interactively as they move the slider, showing what share is an immigrant, but also showing what share is a non-immigrant based on the response that people give. So they can very easily see, okay, if I'm saying that there's 30% of immigrants, that means there's only 70% of non-immigrants. They can see it very clearly and visually. So I think this is actually not priming people to give a larger number, if anything. Another thing that may come to your mind is, well, what is the definition of immigrants? And the definition we give people is people who are foreign born, so who are not born in the country. So it's basically first generation immigrants. The reason to do this is to avoid issues related to citizenship rules or naturalization rules that differ across country. And it's also in line with the OECD definition of an immigrant. But you may say, well, people may disagree with that definition, and maybe they include second-generation immigrants in their count as well. If you added second-generation immigrants, you would definitely not close that big gap. Um, you would move closer to reality, a bit in the US especially, 
but definitely not in other countries. So this gap is very starkly there. People really overestimate the share of immigrants in their country. And there's some other misperceptions that people have. So let me just show you a few select ones. Particularly relevant for the issue of redistribution is perhaps this one, which is what share of people think that immigrants get at least twice the, the amount of transfers than non-immigrants? So how reliant on government transfers are immigrants? And you can see that this share is sizable in quite a few countries. But in fact, this is not true in any of these countries. So it's not the case. In fact, the transfers are relatively similar on average uh, between immigrants and non-immigrants. And so countries like Sweden, Italy, France really overestimate the number of transfers that immigrants get relative to non-immigrants. And then another question that is quite relevant for the issue of redistribution is this one. So this question here asks people to imagine two identical men. So they're identical in terms of income, family situation, job, where they live, etc. The only difference is that one of them is an immigrant called Mohammed, and the other one is a non-immigrant called John. And we ask people, based on what we described, do you think that Mohammed pays less taxes, the same or more taxes than John? And does Mohammed get less transfers, the same or more transfers than John? And this graph here plots the share of respondents who say, well, definitely Mohammed gets more transfers and pays less taxes than John, which, based on the question, you have no reason to answer. The only rational answer, based on the info provided, is the same. And so only respondents in Sweden really get that right. None of them says that Mohammed gets, gets more transfers or pays less taxes. But in countries like Italy or France, you know, more than around a third of respondents think that the immigrants systematically will pay less taxes, will get more transfers. And so you may ask also, well, there's got to be some respondents that are more accurate about immigrants, right? And it turns out that most people across all these countries have quite inaccurate perceptions of immigrants. In particular, it's very systematic that people think that immigrants are economically weaker, more reliant on government transfers, more unemployed, less educated, and also more culturally distant from them in terms of religion, for instance. But there are some groups that are even less accurate. So in particular, people who have larger misperceptions tend to be people who don't have a college education. Also people who tend to work in low paid jobs in sectors where there are a lot of immigrants. And right wing respondents, people who are more right leaning. One thing that's really interesting to note is that left and right wing respondents actually have the same stark misperceptions about the number of immigrants. So it's not that, for instance, right wing immigrants tend to think, oh, there are many more immigrants than left wing people do. However, when they imagine a typical immigrant, the perceptions are very different. Someone on the right will tend to think immigrants are even more economically weaker, even less educated, etc. So the composition of immigrants that is perceived is very different on the left and right, rather than the number. And so what is the link between these perceptions about immigration and support for redistribution? To study this, we first perform an experiment. And this experiment is very subtle. It's basically simply changing the order of the questions that we ask. So a random half of the sample is asked the questions about immigration before they're asked any questions about policies. So they're just prompted to think about immigration in detail before they get to the questions about policies. They're not provided with any other information. And so what we see is that the group that answers the policy questions first, that basically has not thought about immigration at all in that survey, what we find is that that group is much more favorable to redistribution. So just making people think about immigrants without providing any information makes them less likely to support redistribution. And by the way, it goes all the way to supporting less even donations to charities. So it is not only about government redistribution, it is also about private donations to charity. And so what explains this? Well, the key predictors of whether you will reduce support for immigration when you're, for redistribution when you're prompted to think about immigration is if you believe, first and foremost, that immigrants are economically weaker 
and that they free ride on the system so that they don't work as hard, that they tend to be reliant on government transfers. On the other hand, you know, it's not very predictive what is the perceived cultural distance you have to immigrants or what you think their number is. So really, it's the core considerations when it comes to redistribution about how economically weak or strong are immigrants and how, to what extent do they contribute economically rather than free ride. Now, this is about views on redistribution. Views on immigration, how much immigration there should be, are also driven by concerns about already the number of immigrants or the cultural composition of immigrants. But views on redistribution are much more strongly driven by the perceived contributions economically of immigrants. Another thing that we note uh, on immigration is this difference between hard facts, numbers, and narratives. If we show people information on the share of immigrants or on the origins of immigrants, telling them truly where immigrants come from or how many there are, we see that this does not shift their views on redistribution. On the other hand, if we tell people a story about a day in the life of a really hardworking immigrant, which sort of counters you know, the free rider narrative that people may have in mind, that has effects on redistribution views. And so in, in the case of immigration policy, it seems that you know, just hard facts somehow about like the share of immigrants, their origins, etc., is not going to have much effect on views of redistribution, but countering the free rider and economic weakness narrative will. The third project is on racial attitudes. And so again, this idea that people have different notions of how fair it is, whether it's your group or another racial group that is perceived to benefit from redistribution. And this is joint work again with Alberto and Matteo Ferroni, who's here. And what we try to do in this project is to understand how these attitudes towards other races, in particular, we're focusing on black and white respondents in the US, how that shapes people's support for redistribution. And to study this interaction, we survey non-Hispanic black respondents and white respondents in the US. And we survey both adults but also, and this is something different here, we also survey really young teenagers, so people who are aged 13 to 17. And we oversample black respondents so that we basically have half the sample being black and half the sample being white. And we're gonna ask respondents in great detail about what they know about the economic conditions and also opportunities of both their own racial group and the other racial group we're going to ask them about their perceived causes of these inequities. Why do they think there are differences, if they think so, between black and white people? And then we're going to ask them about their degree of support for two types of policies. The first is very targeted, so what you can call race-targeted policies. Those are policies that will explicitly condition on race. For instance, you know, should there be preferential hiring in the labor market? Should there be preferential admission to college? And then we also ask them about general redistribution. This is important because it's an indirect way to close racial gaps. Since you know, black people tend to have lower incomes and lower economic opportunities and conditions than white people in the US, general redistribution will disproportionately normally help um, you know, lower income minorities. And so there's a few things that we find that are really relevant about these notions of fairness. The first is that, yes, across political groups, across races, people have different views about the magnitudes of the gaps between black and white people, both in terms of their economic conditions and their opportunities. So people don't agree on how much inequality there is. However, the biggest disagreement by very far is about the causes that people perceive. So the way people explain the world that they see is very different. So those are the biggest differences. So it's not just about people seeing different things, it's rather about people seeing kind of similar things but explaining them very differently. And because of that, people have very different views on what should be done about these inequalities. So in particular, people's support for either race-targeted policies or general redistribution policies really doesn't depend that much on their perceptions of how big inequalities are between races. They don't, they don't matter that much. 
but they really strongly depend on why they think those gaps exist. And so let me tell you the sort of types of respondents that arise and how they explain the world and what they want to do about it. It turns out that white respondents are really not a homogeneous group here at all. In fact, if you look at democratic white respondents, they tend to be more aligned in their views with black democratic respondents than they are with white Republican ones. And so if you look at the views broadly of black and white Democrats, you can see that they tend to attribute persistent racial gaps to things like discrimination, racism, past slavery. So these are systemic causes. They're not caused by the individual, they're caused by the system. And because of that, they really support income targeted and race targeted interventions to try and reduce those gaps. On the other hand, if you're someone who's a white Republican respondent on average, you will tend to attribute these gaps to individual actions or individual failures in, in these cases. So you will tend to think there's no systemic reasons for things to be like that. It is all up to the individual. And so you'll be less inclined to support either redistribution or race-targeted policies. What was incredibly striking to us is that these racial and partisan gaps are already very prevalent among teenagers. So the very young people that we survey, they show partisan gaps that are very much in line with their parents' political affiliation, uh, and sometimes even bigger ones. And so these views seem to be already very much internalized or entrenched in teenagers. And so we also try to do some experiments here to see what changes people's views, if anything. So what we do is to show people information on the magnitudes of the gaps between black and white people in the US in earnings or in mobility. Remember that ladder that we saw on average for people? We can show it to people, but separately for black and white kids. So these are basically um, information treatments about how big are current racial gaps. We have another type of treatment that instead explains people to people some of the causes of those racial gaps, and in particular explains some of its systemic causes, like systemic racism. So what we see is very much in line with the correlations that just showing people how big the gaps are, how unequal things are between black and white people, doesn't change their views on policy. And this, is, this makes sense because it doesn't change their beliefs about why these gaps exist. You're showing people a reality, but they explain it to themselves very differently according to the way they used to explain it to themselves. So you're not really changing the why or the causes. But if we actually explain to people the causes, it does change people's views. However, there's groups of people that still have very entrenched views and it's difficult to move those most important views for redistribution. In particular, some people who are on the right of the political spectrum will see that information about the explanation of causes and will think it is left-wing biased. It is basically not the truth, it is a biased explanation. And so we can sort of perhaps see a little bit of a tiny, you know, miniature image of the world here on a very simplified scale which is that although there are clearly many racial gaps and large ones, and although many people are at least to some extent aware that there are these gaps, they disagree on the causes very deeply for what they see, and so they disagree on what should be done about them. The final um, project I wanted to tell you about that's related to people's views on fairness is how people's own position relative to others around them shapes their views. And this is joined with Christopher Fitberg and Klaus Kreiner. So our starting point here is this idea that people may care about where they are relative to others and that may shape their core views on what is fair or not. But to answer this question is actually quite difficult because people may be comparing themselves to many other people. Right? They may be comparing themselves to people at their workplace, or their neighbors, or people of the same age overall, or people of the same gender. So there's many possible reference groups that you may have when you're comparing yourself. And you may be more or less accurate when you're ranking yourself among some of these groups, and some of these groups may matter more to you. So what we do in this project is to match administrative tax data from Denmark to our own design survey. 
And we're going to start by actually asking people for each of the groups that they're part of, which includes large groups like one's cohort, one's sector, one's education group, one's city, and also small groups like one's schoolmates, one's co-workers, one's neighbors. We're going to ask people what they know about the income distribution of that group. So for instance, what do they know about the median income in that group, which we're going to call P50? What they know about the top of that group, which we're going to call P95? And then we're going to ask people to rank themselves in each of these groups. So to show you in a bit more detail how we do this, here, for instance, is an individual who's born in 1970. And we're going to ask them, what is the median income for people born in 1970? Basically, what's the median income in your cohort? So they put some answer. And then we're going to ask them about other groups that they're part of. For instance, this here is someone born in 1970 who is a man, uh, lives in Copenhagen, has a master or PhD, and works in finance or insurance. So we're going to ask that man about the median income in all these groups that he is part of. We're going to also ask them about the top incomes in, these, in all these groups. So what do they know about the income distributions of all these groups? And then we're going to ask them to rank themselves um, on a ladder, a bit like the ladder I showed you earlier, and try to see do people accurately rank themselves. So what do we find? What we find is basically depicted on this graph here which is showing you for the cohort, so how you place yourself among others of the same age. On the horizontal axis is your true position among others in your cohort. And on the vertical axis is the average or the median perception by position. You can see that there's this flattened S shape, this, this form that we are going to call center bias, whereby people who are ranked lower will tend to overestimate their position. And people who are ranked higher will tend to underestimate their position. And so we have this systematic pattern whereby people who are richer will tend to think they're actually ranked lower and vice versa for those that are poor. And in fact, this is something that we're going to see across all the groups, so not just the cohort. We're going to see this for all these groups that we ask people about, all these large groups and also smaller groups. The large groups are your cohort, your gender group, your municipality, um, your sector of work, and people with the same education. You can see the same center bias everywhere. And we can actually say exactly where it comes from. If you ask people, remember as we do, what is the median income in these groups? And what is the top incomes in these groups? We see that people systematically tend to infer from their own income. So if you're richer, you're going to think that others are richer too. You're going to guess a higher median income and a higher top income. And if you're poor, you're going to think others are poor too. So you're going to guess a lower median and a lower top income. And in such a way that you're basically closer to the center. So basically, people who are at the top, they underestimate their position because they think others are actually richer than is the case. And people at the bottom will overestimate their position because they tend to think others are poorer than is the case. You can also see where these perceptions are particularly big. It's particularly for your sector and your education group that you're more wrong. And this is the groups in which those at the very bottom tend to overestimate their position the most. So when you're a low-income person and you're thinking of others with the same education, you don't realize how much more others are making. You tend to really overestimate how good you're doing. Same if you're someone who's low-paid in a given sector, you just don't realize how, more, how much more others are making. And we can also look at how this is related to people's views on fairness. And I'll summarize some of the findings here. First of all, we can look at which of these inequalities, for which of these groups do people think inequalities are most unfair. And we find that inequalities between coworkers in the same firm or in the same sector, or between people with the same education levels are most unfair. So those are the inequalities that people dislike the most. So people are much more willing to say, for instance, you know, it's okay if there's inequality in income, if you're in the same city, or you have the same age, or you have the same gender, but it's less okay if you have the same education level and you work in the same sector. So in a sense, these factors that we economists think are crucial for shaping income, like education and sector, 
Conditional on those, people think the remaining inequality is less fair. And we can also see that your own social position is very strongly related to your views on inequality. In particular, if you're ranked higher in a given group, you tend to think that income differences, inequality, in that group is more fair. So if you're doing better, you're going to say, okay, inequality is not that unfair. And you're also going to think a range of other things. You're going to think that income differences in that group are more likely due to effort rather than to luck. You're more likely to believe that your own hard work has paid off, to be satisfied with life, and to think that high-income earners deserve your income. You're also more likely to vote for right-wing parties and to support less redistribution. So where you put yourself relative to others is very strongly correlated with a range of views. And what we can also see is that some of these views are quite sticky in the sense that they don't really change over time when your position changes. So an example is political views. Well, your views on how fair inequality is actually changes when your position changes. So if you're doing less well this year, you'll tend to think things are less fair and vice versa. And we also look at some changes in position that happen to people because of what you may call shocks or events. So they can be positive events like a promotion at work or negative events like unemployment, disability, hospitalization. So what we see is that a negative event makes people think that inequality is more unfair, less fair. A positive event will make people think that inequality is less unfair. And then finally, just to end, remember um, that um, we ask people to rank themselves among others in each group. And to half the sample, we're actually gonna tell the reality. So we're gonna tell them where they truly rank. And to the other half, we're not gonna say anything. So here, for instance, this man uh, that you remember, born in 1970, when they are asked to rank themselves among others in the same cohort, born in 1970, they put themselves at P70. But unfortunately, we have to tell them that they're actually at P57. So they're lower than they think they are. What happens? Well, when we tell people that they're ranked lower than they thought in, in any given group, they start thinking that inequality in that group is more unfair. So that seems to be a causal link whereby if you shift people's perceptions of where they rank, you change their views on how fair or unfair that is. And so I hope this gave you some idea of what sort of views go into people's fairness perceptions and their preferences for redistribution. It is only the beginning, only scratching the surface, because ultimately, as we saw, the most important facts when people support redistribution is really who they think wins, who loses, and how fair they think that is. And there's many more topics beyond mobility, immigration, positions, racial attitudes that have to be explored in that spirit. And I think uh, hopefully you do a lot of great work on it because there's really many unanswered questions. So thank you very much. Um, so it's really an honor for me to start the discussion uh, of the uh, presentation and the work that Stephanie has uh, illustrated. And so to start, um, I wanted to uh, sort of give some, if you want, background motivation for uh, the stream of work that Stephanie has uh, presented to us. And let me say that I think there is multiple ways in which we can motivate this work, which already, I think, highlights uh, its relevance. So, but the starting point, uh, you know, the point I wanted to start from is the idea that, uh, you know, growing economic inequalities and, and awareness of, of economic inequality has really intensified uh, the debate around the appropriate public policies that we can implement uh, to tackle inequality. And within this, uh, uh, an area of discussion is the optimal design of redistributive programs. Um, so, if we... Uh, take kind of as, as, as our um, uh, main tool for reasoning about optimal design, the standard public finance framework, we know that the key aspects of the optimal design of tax and transfers program is the balancing of the redistributive gains that uh, we can achieve by implementing these programs and their efficiency costs. Okay. 
Um, however, you know, once kind of we, and, and there's a lot of work actually, there's lots of efforts uh, in economics in trying to quantify redistributive gains uh, and efficiency costs. But then obviously we also need to be able to aggregate individual preferences uh, into a social welfare function, uh, so to, to essentially give a, a weight um, to, to uh, how much we care about the winners and the losers. And this social welfare function depends on individual redistributive tastes that um, you know, the work that Stephanie uh, has shown us really uh, uh, studies very well. So this is kind of, these are the key ingredients, if you want, uh, that we need to determine the optimal design of tax and transfers from a public finance perspective. But then obviously there is the political side of it, and in particular, if we think of it from a political economy standpoint, uh, the sustainability of redistributive programs is going to depend on individual perceptions around the trustworthiness and the capability of institutions. I chose kind of these as background motivation because uh, it's, it's quite theoretical, but I think it's really kind of, it illustrates sort of the richness of areas that the, the work that Stephanie uh, has shown us uh, can talk to. And in particular, um, uh, in particular, the surveys that, that she has run more recently really illuminate on all of these key ingredients uh, that I've just uh, mentioned. So I think the work that she uh, has been doing is really kind of uh, remarkable because it helps us understanding how people think about redistribution. And through this, it can help us to answer a lot of fundamental questions that help us uh, kind of understanding uh, how, uh, like public policies that concern inequality and redistribution. And another point that is particularly remarkable is the way in which this is being achieved, which is through an innovative tool that is uh, uh, survey data and experiments. And what is uh, possibly even more innovative and unique is the link of these uh, surveys with administrative data, which really kind of uh, uh, provides uh, an enormous wealth uh, of information. So I can see at least four benefits of understanding how people reason about uh, uh, redistribution. Um, that we can gather from this survey data. The first is that we can learn about the information set that individuals have when they reason about public policies. The second point is that, as Stephanie illustrated very nicely, we can identify what factors matter the most with, for, for individual reasoning about uh, redistributive policies. And what comes out of uh, her research is that you know, people care most about winners and losers and care most uh, about fairness. But once we know that fairness is uh, a relevant factor here, I think the next step is to try and understand what determines heterogeneity in these fairness views and fairness norms. And um, an important element of uh, the survey, um, the information that we can gather from the surveys is that we can really disentangle whether these uh, views around fairness are due to misperceptions about economic facts or differences in value judgments or policy view, uh, political views, uh, if you want. Um, and, and finally, you know, given that what emerges is that misperceptions are indeed a factor uh, behind kind of differences in views around fairness, then the next kind of thing that we can uh, um, achieve through this, uh, these tools is to understand to what extent better information can actually affect perceptions uh, and views. And all the evidence that um, that Stephanie uh, has reviewed um, is really kind of about the f different factors that can shape preferences for, for a distribution. So to start this discussion, I want to highlight three key themes that uh, I've been prompted to think when reading Stephanie's work. So the first is related to the role of aggregate economic shocks. So in particular, in the last uh, paper that Stephanie was mentioned, um, I found it very fascinating that uh, through the link between um, survey and administrative data, they can actually show that, for example, take negative idiosyncratics of individual specific shocks, such as experiencing an unemployment spell, a health shock, um, really uh, decrease the perceived uh, fairness uh, of inequality. 
But again, these are idiosyncratic shock. And I think, I mean, uh, it's our shared experience. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is really a, a, a large aggregate shock that has generated uh, substantial inequalities across social and demographic groups, things, for example, men and women or individuals of different age groups. Um, and these shocks have tended to hurt some of these groups uh, more than others. So in particular, I think that the scale and the scope of COVID as an aggregate shock might have uh, made these unequal effects more salient to the population as a whole. But, and, and so I was wondering kind of from uh, uh, the evidence that you have collected, whether you can think that these very uh, large uh, changes in salience in inequality might trigger changes in preferences for uh, redistributions that are also potentially long lasting. But at the same time, I think we should also sort of uh, emphasize that the current period has put uh, governments uh, under a lot of strain um, and uh, governments have been facing major uh, policy and political challenges and these might have affected individuals uh, trust in institutions and perceptions around government's uh, capability. The second theme that I wanted also to, uh, uh, to discuss is, you know, whether it is just how much redistribution we want, or also what type, uh, what are the tools essentially through which we, we want to achieve that level of uh, redistribution. So in other words, kind of different perceptions uh, around fairness are, um, are they going to not only affect kind of the quantity, but also of the redistribution, but uh, the choice of the redistributive tools. And what, again, prompted me to think about this is, if you want an observation about the dramatically different uh, labor market policy response that governments have implemented on the two sides of the Atlantic in response to, uh, uh, to the COVID shock. In particular, in European countries, the main tool that has been used has been short-time work schemes, so uh, essentially subsidy for hour reductions that have been provided to firms experiencing the shock. And instead, on the other hand, the US has really relied very heavily on unemployment insurance. Now, we do have evidence. Uh, it comes from uh, what we've seen previously, but also from other works, that fairness is an important uh, institutional tenet in European, uh, in European countries. Um, and short-term work, I think, we can view of it uh, as opposed to unemployment insurance um, as a social insurance tool that essentially spreads out the cost of recession across more workers rather than concentrating them uh, on um, uh, a small group of workers that would, that would suffer larger losses. And so, again, this observation kind of prompted me to think about whether that could, there could also be uh, differences, again, in the choice of redistributive tools. Then the third uh, theme that I wanted to bring up is instead the role of public policies. Um, and here kind of the starting point is the idea that, you know, if we think about the workforce theoretical models of preference formation, typically they predict that, you know, poor, relatively poor individuals are going to demand uh, more redistribution. But actually this, I think, posits uh, or assumes, uh, importantly, that all individuals are going then to be able to uh, benefit from increased redistribution, at least proportionally uh, to their income. But in reality, uh, you know, with limited resources, eligibility might be often restricted to certain subgroups of the population, um, and this might often be done with arbitrary rules, those that we as empiricists typically cherish, but that actually might end up making similar individuals uh, have very unequal access to uh, redistribution. And so, kind of, again, another sort of question that came to mind is whether uh, uh, you know, unequal access to welfare and more generally kind of uh, public policies and the winners and losers of public policies might shape views around fairness, redistribution and, and trust in government. And even kind of besides thinking about eligibility, um, uh, another uh, question is whether uh, there, there could be a role for public policies and public service more generally in reducing misperceptions around economic facts, for example, through the uh, promotion of pay transparency policies or through the provision, say, of finer public statistics. Could these be ways in which actually public policies could uh, change uh, perceptions? 
So these are the three themes, but before concluding, I also wanted to spend a couple of words um, around kind of the methods that are uh, uh, used uh, by Stephanie and, and her co-authors. So as you've seen, this is based on large-scale online surveys that really kind of help us asking directly people uh, how they think, how they form views around important economic uh, and social phenomenon. And this is... Um, uh, a very innovative tool that uh, helps us kind of understand more about aspects that would be otherwise uh, not observable. I think it's been a very radical uh, innovation that challenges uh, both the, like the methods, data, and assumptions that we traditionally make. Especially in the, in the, in the field of public finance, uh, the use of large-scale administrative data has become you know, the, uh, quite common. And within that, uh, as uh, Stephanie already mentioned before, we typically implement, we tend to believe in reveal preference uh, approaches, obviously they're based on a lot of assumptions or more um, uh, or, or structural approaches, but these are all kind of ma based on, on, on strong assumptions that can in a sense be uh, directly uh, tested or, or, or supported uh, or not with the evidence that uh, can be collected uh, by the surveys. And I think this, you know, again, it's, it's really something to be praised. And in addition to that, the fact that her research shows that, you know, the complementarity between survey methods and others, if you want, more traditional uh, methods can really pave the way for uh, new avenues of research. And last but not least, one final point that I want to make is that this is actually also a public good. You didn't mention it, but um, uh, all the data that uh, have been collected can be accessed uh, directly from uh, the website of the Social Economics Lab. And I think I want to close with this. I think we all <laughs> like public goods, and that's uh, a very important contribution. <laughs> Okay, so I think now we can uh, take um, any questions from the audience. Um, maybe I can. Well, uh, thank you for the presentation. So, I mean, I think the impression we get from these experiments that you run is, is kind of optimistic, right? So we can change uh, the opinions of people, at least in some of these experiments, right? So they seem kind of elastic to, to new information, right? So anecdotally, I, I think you get the opposite impression from other polls that you can, or I don't know, in some TV shows, right? When you try to communicate with voters or people that are very polarized, right? That have very ideologically extreme positions, uh, if you give more information on things like immigration, uh, on the one hand, for instance, to, to voters and the extreme right, or new information about, uh, I don't know, the cost of taxation to voters on the extreme left, they become even more entrenched or even more extreme in their ideological standing, right? So uh, my main question is whether you examine a bit also the heterogeneity in the effect, depending on the initial position of these people and whether that makes a difference. Thank you. Great, really great question about the effects of information. And first of all, is it actually the case that information always works? No, so some of the findings are you know, in that direction, but others are not at all. So the first sort of type of findings is about what type of information and in what context. So to contrast just a few examples we saw here, if you give people just facts about immigration, nothing happens because it is not really addressing the core sort of problem they have with immigrants when it comes to redistribution, which is they think immigrants tend to, you know, free ride on the welfare system, not contribute economically. So you really need to be able to convince them of people not free riding, which is hard to do with pure facts as well, uh, because that is sort of a subjective a bit view about people not putting in effort, etc. On the other hand, if you give people facts about mobility, it does change their views on mobility. They do believe those facts, um, as I said, Lack of opportunity is a bipartisan worry, but even there, the effect of information is quite different based on whether you are on the left or right. So the solution you will want to that new problem you just discovered or that, you, that got amplified to you is completely different between people on the left who want more government action, more redistribution, more equality of opportunity policies, and people on the right who want less government, period. So the effects of information are quite subtle depending on the context, the domain, 
And then yes, they definitely depend on who's getting the info and sort of what is the starting point. I just gave the example of left and right on mobility issues. And I think the very stark example is in the, in the racial attitudes paper, where depending on where you stand in the political spectrum, you're going to believe the info on the causes of racial gaps or not. You know, you're going to... Rather than if you're someone who already thinks that you have a certain standard and you're already taking individual action, in that case, you will perceive that treatment as completely left-wing biased, basically. And so those entrenched views are very difficult to move. So the short answer is really, it depends. And the slightly longer answer is it depends on the domain you're looking at, you know, which of these topics is it, um, the type of info we're looking at between, you know, hard facts to narratives to explanations, and then it depends on the starting point of people. So completely agree with your comment about this being actually a much more complex, not always optimistic uh, effect. I find your evidence also very intriguing and uh, by your story I think it's interesting that you can basically alter the stated beliefs across the political spectrum but what I would be curious in and I probably assume that's difficult to do but um, did you make an attempt to follow up on the actual um, voting of these people I mean when it comes to election day do they stick to their beliefs so the, the question about following up is a really good one. So first thing you can do is simply to do a follow-up survey, right, after a few weeks have passed to see whether anything persists of the treatment effect you initially saw. And we do that in many of these projects, and the answer is the effects I told you are significant, you know, persist with some decay. Effects which were not there in the first place, you know, are not there. Now, to look at actual behaviors, uh, would be relatively difficult because the information here works, which also means lots of other info that you're getting throughout your days, throughout your weeks, etc., which could be totally canceling out the info we provided, you know, goes in the other way. So people don't live in a vacuum, right? They keep watching whatever news they're watching, keep reading whatever news they're reading. And so the power you would have to detect an effect you know, months down in an election or something like that are very, very, very small, even if you could match respondents. And I think this is not necessarily something bad. This is truly saying what it is, which is that we get a lot of info, a lot of exposure, and I cannot experimentally keep you in a vacuum. Um, and so I'm losing a lot of power to try and look at these effects down the road. In the final project, which matches survey data to administrative data, one of the benefits is that you can still see people in the admin data, you know, basically forever, as long as they remain um, you know, alive and are tracked in the Danish data. And so there, you can imagine many more interesting things. For instance, having told people something that's quite relevant to them directly, for instance, that they're actually ranked lower in their firm or in their sector than they are, you could imagine that affecting their job search behavior, uh, their willingness to look for other opportunities once they realize that they're actually paid less than others. And so that is something that could be potentially much more powered and to look at in the future. Um. Um, I have uh, the, um, the following thought that uh, maybe you, you will uh, know how to translate it into, you know, checking on the data whether this mechanism is there or not. Uh, of course, you know the, the, the work on the beliefs in the just world and whether you know, uh, people in, a, in the US versus Europe believe that uh, you know, success is a function of effort or a function of luck, etc. And this seems to be quite uh, uh, connected with the, diff with the results on social mobility because at the same time, if in the US uh, society I believe that success is due to effort, I am uh, politically inclined towards, you know, not supporting the uh, education and public health, etc. That, uh, in turn, if in place, they can actually uh, increase de facto uh, social mobility. So, in that society where somehow, according to Benabou and Tirol, and to some extent the Alizina and Angelito's paper, 
the, 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 there is a mechanism that maintains the belief that, that the just world is, is, uh, is that one with uh, respect of effort and freedom, etc. You, you, you have also your results, that is, not only this leads uh, de facto to, to lower uh, social mobility because of the lack of, of policies, but, but the difference in the perception remains high, right? Because uh, that one remains low, whereas the, 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 other, the other mechanisms that keep the, the belief in the just world on the, on the effort side maintains it high. And vice versa, if you believe that it is uh, more on, uh, uh, you know, due, to, due to luck, then uh, uh, policy-wise you want more, uh, you know, public, good, uh, public goods, etc. Mm -hmm. that has an effect that makes the, the social mobility higher than what, that, than what they think it is consistently with the, their uh, pessimistic views about, uh, about luck. Yes. Now, the, this was a great comment um, that also summarized, you know, two theories behind basically the link between mobility perceptions and views on redistribution, uh, the beliefs in a just world or the upward mobility hypothesis, the PUM hypothesis. Um, and so this is basically theories that can explain why people who think there's more mobility want less or more redistribution. So the way I view our patterns here are to highlight that there is a bit of a gap between perceptions and reality. So to your point, um, these theories think, you know, these theories imply that people actually have accurate perceptions, but here there's an additional gap between your perceptions and reality that can itself be sustained, so it's like a more complex theory, that can itself be sustained by the policies in place, uh, including your own views about the government and what you want them to do, um, and that can, that can be itself feeding on the misperceptions. So I think these are really, um, really critical theories to perhaps augment with misperceptions in there, so it's not the case that we end up in equilibrium actually having the right perceptions, clearly. Uh, we still have those gaps there. Um, and, you know, one thing that I do find very fascinating that's also lacking from, you know, these theories is that we clearly don't have the same response to the same problem. Uh, so, for instance, in the Aldezina and Galetos framework, where, you know, basically in Europe people think there's, there's less mobility, there's more sticky social classes, which is borne out by the data. People are even too pessimistic relative to reality. People want more government action, vice versa in the US. What we see here is that actually there's cleavages within countries too, based on where you are in the political spectrum. And for some people uh, on the right, even if you think there's less mobility, you don't want the government to do anything against it. So great food for thought uh, in your comments. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie, and thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you have any information or any insight about what our people believe about the role of genetic in determining success. So I'm thinking about the slide when you show the two figures, and from my understanding, you are trying to determine what is the belief about the opportunity, so parental investment and economics uh, opportunity, but I'm, think I'm thinking whether the beliefs about uh, whether poor parents have, are poorly genetically, gen genetically, or even like some sort of immigrants could be poor genetically, can affect uh, um, your, uh, uh, your result, and also whether this could be interacting with the perception of fairness. So for example, redistribution shouldn't, doesn't make sense because I think that someone is genetically more la less able than me, so there is no point of giving uh, them uh, some uh, um, resources. So I was wondering if you have any thinking about that. This is really interesting, which is basically, why do we see this link between parents and children? How do people explain it? So as you see here, we're asking in a much more reduced form way, basically take these parents, here are their children, where will their children end up? And I do agree, and we don't do it, that it would be very interesting, so potentially a research topic here, um, to try and understand why, what drives that mobility in the first place. So one hypothesis is, uh, you know, some endowments, um, could be health, could be some human capital, um, it could be, you know, occupational persistence, it could be that your parents just put so much inputs into you, whether it's money or time or better networks or better schools, etc. So I think tracing out what people actually have in mind when they say the parents' outcomes will determine the kids' outcomes would be really interesting for, for research. Um, yes, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, great presentation. Uh, I was uh, curious on whether you have used 
um, as to where these uh, misperceptions, but also uh, value judgment, and in particular the heterogeneity might be coming from. For instance, in your Danish study, it seems to me that, you know, one could uh, think about these uh, um, insensitivity, so to speak, as coming, for instance, from the fact that people, when you ask them about the ranking, they tend to think in the first instance about people, other people similar to themselves. But in that case, if you were to remind them, for instance, of the worst neighborhood in Copenhagen, you know, maybe they would change their view dramatically, even if, in fact, you have not been providing uh, any, any information to them. But more broadly, as these misperceptions are formed, you know, through the course of one's life, one question is whether you think there might be a role for, you know, the social system and the type of interaction you have in your social circle, schools, the media, politics themselves. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about exploring these issues? Great. Um, really great questions here. So let me answer about two of the projects, one that you mentioned on Denmark. So, and one on, on the immigration. So in Denmark, um, I didn't show it here, but since we have so much information, we can actually try to correlate at least people's perceptions with various, various things. So one hypothesis is that you're learning from observing others. And so if things are more visible, for instance, if your neighbors have more visibly expensive cars or visibly expensive homes, et cetera, this will shape your view on, on, uh, on how rich they are. And we can see, for instance, that people who live on longer roads have worse information about their neighbors. People who work in companies with more people have worse information. People who have been in a company for a shorter period of time who've just switched have worse information. Same if you've just moved to a new neighborhood uh, or a new city. Um, if there's more visible consumption, like more expensive cars, either in your coworkers or in your neighbors, you will tend to underrank yourself because you think, oh, these people are richer as signaled by their cars or the price of their homes when in fact they just have that extra consumption there. So we can correlate with these things that signals that there is some learning and there is some observability that is sometimes higher than in other cases. Um, we can also look at other things, you know, like unionization that sort of gives some information about, uh, about wages um, and then the, simply the dispersion in a group, you know, and it turns out that if you're in a more dispersed group, you're actually a bit more accurate, I guess because the gaps between percentiles is larger and so it's less easy to just, you know, have an idea where an income is. On the immigration paper, um, there, you know, someone brilliant suggested to us to look at where misperceptions come from. And what we find is that um, it's very correlated with sort of locally the characteristics of immigrants. So you seem to over extrapolate from what's happening around you. So if you live in an area with more immigrants, you will tend to think they're more immigrants. Uh, if your own parents are immigrants or you work in a sector with many immigrants, you also think they're more immigrants. So you tend to sort of over extrapolate from what's around you immediately. Same goes for some characteristics, like if immigrants tend to be more unemployed, specifically more unemployed than non-immigrants in your area. I you know according to a theory of stereotypes, for instance, that, that, that you have uh, developed, you will tend to exaggerate that characteristics of immigrants nationally as well. So clearly there's this over-extrapolation, over-reliance on what you can see, and then stereotyping perhaps according to those characteristics too. Thank you. No, thanks. Uh, I had a quick, uh, more technical question. Uh, so if, if I guess econ is now obsessed with the difference in difference in estimators, I, I think political science is obsessed with the validity of survey responses. And I think there are four properties that I would like to highlight and I would like to know how you engage with this in your work. The first one is um, um, answer, the instability of these answers over time. So people ask the same individual the same question and they change massively over time. Also as a function of some shocks or events in the economy, for instance. Um, the other one is about um, when people are asked about changes in their beliefs. And this has been shown to be quite problematic because people 
engage in substitution and they, they say how much they act, like what their belief actually is. So I think these are two, and, and I think that, that, that um, so there are some papers now that show that, for instance, when people are asked to give reasons why they support that opinion, then this, uh, the answer change, right? So these, I think, are important because you know, this field of work is really much a data-driven and data-intensive uh, exercise. So if really the validity of this data is, is rather poor, like what are we really learning about these important questions? So that's my, sorry, too long question. No, no, thank you for this very thought-provoking and challenging question. So of course, it's very much a quality of the design here um, that totally shapes the credibility of the results and the, and the data. So contrary to other settings where you may be worried about data quality and be sort of helpless about it, here with surveys you have a control over data quality. So right, it's all in the design and in the sample that you get. And so some of the issues you raised are of course very relevant and we're constantly trying to figure out, and by we I mean, you know, we economists working on this, but lots of people in psychology, lots of people in political science and in sociology who have used these methods, you know, for a long time in different ways on different topics, constantly keep developing to avoid these problems. So just to throw a few things out there, um, you know, you often try to ask the same sort of core questions in different ways and try to see whether the answers are actually, you know, stable or varying a lot. You try to invert the order of questions and sort of be able to control for that to avoid, you know, systematically having prime people with some info before another one. Um, you tend to avoid asking people the same question sort of before and after a treatment because people have this idea of sticking to their, the previously given question and that may underestimate the effect. You can also use some open-ended questions to even get, you know, like open-ended text instead of fixed answer choices to get people's first order concerns without starting to prime them to think about specific options or not before you drill down. So there's a lot of basically methods that are constantly developed that we're developing too to try and address this. So very much like the diff and diff example you gave, um, it's a constantly evolving uh, thing where we're improving the empirical methods which in this case include the generation of the data itself. That's why I think it's also extremely exciting. It is a, it is a tool that is constantly being improved and developed and uh, that we can certainly use for many more things. Thanks, uh, it, it was very interesting. Uh, so I wanted to ask you something about um, elite discourse regarding uh, immigration narratives, let's say. So uh, re related to the findings that uh, just thinking about immigration makes people less supportive of redistributions, uh, would you think that that creates a, a not even creates changes, the incentives for elite discourse uh, about immigration. So to, 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 have an, to, to make an example, let's think I am a right-wing politician, a center-right politician, I am against redistributions, I don't have strong feelings regarding uh, immigration, but now I'm more inclined to uh, make an anti-immigration statement because that creates uh, un less, less support for distributions. What, what do you think about this? It's a great question, and actually it's, uh, it's actually the last few sentences in the conclusion of the paper. Um, and it was Alberto's idea, um, I can say it outright, exactly this, which is that, well, now that you see that there's this link, just making people think about immigration reduces their support for redistribution, it's clear that if you don't want redistribution, well, one way to sort of generate that, if this effect is really true on a large scale, is to talk always about immigration, particularly perhaps also about uh, immigrants' reliance on welfare or even just mentioning immigration all the time. Um, and so that's one of the conjectures, absolutely, uh, that this could be something leveraged by basically either parties or politicians who are in the end uh, anti-redistribution, even if they may not have strong views about immigration. At this point, it's a pure conjecture. We don't know the intentions, of course, of people, but there may be ways to test it by looking at the sort of platforms of these parties and comparing it to the discourse. And that could be very interesting to do. It looks like we're done with questions. So thank you so much, Julia. Uh, let me just take a, like a minute to respond to your amazing comments because I think you 
Uh, I think Julia gave a really, really great discussion that should give many, many research ideas here as well because it was really zooming out and focusing on the big, big picture that goes way beyond the papers I presented and that was really fascinating. So the issue of you know, different tools uh, of policy is really, really important. The thing about aggregate shocks changing our perhaps collective views, I'm really curious to see what research will come out after COVID on how this may have affected our very fundamental views. Um, and you know, overall the complementarity to our other methods that we're using that I think should be combined with survey data to get at mechanisms to dig deeper into stuff we can't see in other data. I think those slides are really valuable and uh, uh, should be a great reference. So thank you so much. And thank you, Nicola, for the generous introduction as well. Uh, that was very kind of you. Thank you all. Thank you.